Good morning and welcome to the Robin Report. I'm your host, Elliot Robin, so get ready to get triggered. Good morning and welcome to the Robin Reports season finale. I'm your host, Elliot Robin, as you might have heard in our intro. And with me for the last time this season is my expert panel, Marshall, Adam, and Daniel. How are you guys? Good. We Doing are very well. Tired. Great. But, exhausted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, just tell them to remove the headphones then. Um, um, just take off the headphones then. So, um, to off. begin, as for Spirit Live rules and regulations... Um, All opinions expressed on the show are not those of Ryerson or Ryerson faculty and are only those of the individual commentators. Viewer discretion is advised. No, Um, they're not hearing it from a microphone. No, they're not hearing anything at all? Okay, just keep the door open and have them take the headphones off and you'll just hear our voices. For now. Yeah. Your mics are good though, so... Yeah. All right, that sounds good. So we're just going to skim over the weekly recap because we do have a jam-packed show for today. Um, So the first thing is that Toronto Police will not be at Pride this year. Um, Even though they've submitted an application about a month ago, uh, Chief Mark Saunders actually withdrew it yesterday. um, And he says that he did that because he wants to show that he's paying attention to the concerns of the community. Uh, In other news, there were clashes on the Israeli border, um, I think this week or last week. Um, both, both, uh, and it was um, Palestinians on their uh, march of return or mm-hmm. something yep. along those lines. Um, and Palestinians say that it was peaceful protests and that they were just demonstrating. Whereas Israeli police have said that Molotov cocktails were thrown, rocks were thrown, and it became extremely violent. Um, Hamas has claimed that about ten of the sixteen people killed were Hamas affiliates. Um, but more news will come later on. And lastly, there was a shooting at YouTube headquarters. Um, a Iranian woman uh, was the shooter, and that's as much as I know right now. Um, yeah, I think um, she the only, had, the only yeah. thing I've heard additionally is that apparently her dad claims that she hated YouTube with a passion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was uh, talking about how her workout videos were being censored. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I did just want to uh, jump in quickly. Now I uh, I was watching my uh, our, our last episode uh, from last oh, Wednesday, yeah. and uh, so I wanted to uh, offer a apology to our viewers. <clears throat> As I was watching, I did notice that uh, I was uh, very hard, unduly hard on the um, on David Hogg and Emma Gonzalez. I uh, I went against my principles and I criticized them as people instead of criticizing their ideas, and I shouldn't have done that. Uh, so I, again, I'd like to apologize to our viewers, and I uh, I do hope that you can forgive me and continue to respect me as a commentator. You know, I uh, I made a mistake, and I uh, I realize that now. <laughs> I'll think about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Marshall, uh, for that. Um, and we do have two very special guests in studio with us today, Saeed and John. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Always my pleasure. Always great. Uh, so. <laughs> On our final episode, we're going to move on to our main story now, which is terrorism. On our final episode, we've decided to take on a very heavy issue. With a significant increase in shootings and terror attacks, it's important to understand why they're happening and how to fix it. With less and less fact-checking, it's even harder to decipher the statistics regarding terrorism. Far left, far right, Islamic extremism, uh, Islamic extremism, lone wolf. Today, we'll find out whom the biggest threat to the safety of Canada and the U.S. is, and again, how we can stop them. Uh, Before we start, remember that we are live on Facebook, so you can comment on our feed to have your thoughts read live on air. And remember, also, we do have our hot take contest. When you hear somebody say hot take at any point during the show, comment what we said about, uh, and you could win a $30 gift card to either Tim's or Starbucks. And I think that's a pretty wicked deal. I'd say so. Yeah, I'd, say, I'd agree <laughs> with that. Like you can't go wrong with that, yeah. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, before I get into the questions, Saeed and John, why don't you tell us a little about yourself so our audience can get to know you. We'll start with uh, you, Saeed. 
All right, I'm a third year computer science student at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and I am a practicing Muslim, and I have been proud of my identity, and um, with some uh, fairly choice right-leaning views. How about you, John? Well, myself, I also go to UTM, and I'm a third year student as well, but except I'm in political science and uh, history of religions ma dual major. Um, myself, I'm a practicing apostolic Christian, still doing a rock, paper, scissors battle between or Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And I do have some relatively right wing leanings as well, I would say. Awesome. Very uh, awesome to get to know you. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, first question I'm going to ask is we'll just put the topic up right away because we're starting with it. The first question is to all of you, what is ter terrorism from both a definitive and social point of view? So what's the actual definition of it, and how does society define terrorism? So anybody can jump in. So I think it's really important that terrorism is defined as it actually is. You know, words have meanings for a reason, and we see it used incorrectly, the term terrorism, a lot. Um, and the, by definition, it is a act of of violence or attempted violence um, in order to push a certain political agenda or or social agenda or any kind of agenda um, and uh, it's right in the name is terror the idea is to strike terror into people uh, in order to see that agenda or that cause furthered fair enough uh, Adam um, so I I never really gave a definition of terrorism uh, I never really had a definition of terrorism for me it was more like I know it when I see it um, which sounds a little uh, primitive but that's how I, I was for a while um, I've had the privilege of taking a history of terrorism course this semester here at Ryerson and we spent the first sort of three weeks really defining what terrorism meant um, there are so many different kinds there is uh, people versus state state versus state um, group uh, militia versus state um, in, 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 and many others to go on. Um, they, we went over the definitions by, you know, the, the U.S. Congress, the U.N., uh, uh, all these different international organizations, uh, Germany's definition, the EU's definition, blah, blah. But um, I think Marshall sum, summarized it up pretty quickly. It is, it is violence to push an agenda of some kind, whether it be nationalism or just... Um, disturbing a certain group or pushing some sort of ethnic superiority or just general violence to achieve um, political gains. And uh, that's sort of how I've summarized it in my time in the course. And you see it all over the world and it's generally the same thing as you go across. Mm -hmm. What was one of the other questions you were talking about? Uh, how yeah. society perceives it. Yeah. Because um, the, def the, de the text I would definition say that, like, is for political means, um, but how does society kind of think of society it? Society has been like somewhat desensitized to it just because like, um, I would say like due to the effect of globalization, we can see like all of these terrorist attacks that are happening in different parts of the world. It's so common. Like, it's literally like every other day, like if I choke, check on the news, it's like unfortunately something like in the Middle East, like somebody's... Um, Somebody like a blew up some like blew up something with a car or something like that in the name of it's ridiculous and I don't know socially like we've become desensitized to it but um, I don't know it's it's difficult I, I feel like socially like it's difficult to define it because some people view terrorism and they only view um, radical Islamic terrorism when that's not how it, the terrorism is supposed to work it doesn't it, terrorism doesn't necessarily have one. Um, it's not attributed to one particular race or religion or anything like that. Anyone can can can, can commit such a horrible act like that. But um. and uh, Saeed and John, anything you want to chime in? Yeah, um, I would kind of like to draw a distinction between the acts of the individual and the acts of the collective. Mm -hmm. So whenever somebody thinks of terrorism, obviously the thing that comes to mind is Islamic terrorists. Um, but we don't naturally see people who are Confederate believers when they shoot up something as terrorists. And it's mostly because those are individual acts. If it, if it is something that is inspired by a collective which has a propaganda of peddling fear, that is what I would define as terrorism. And it's not just included with Islamic terrorism. There are many states which do terrorist acts. 
and I would decree that as such, but I would not decree an individual acting on his own personal belief, which always tends to be political as an act of terrorism. Yeah, I would like to jump in with that kind of same kind of uh, line of thinking because I see often on social media that a lot of people with an emotional appeal really do want to say that every mass shooting is a form of terrorism because it does indeed strike fear into the average population's heart. However, I think there also has to be a bit more nuance because majority of these mass shootings that we've had, even the... Even, well, actually, no, I'm going to go back to that in another uh, understanding, but regarding to the mass shootings, they do strike fear, but they do not really have some sort of political agenda. But a lot of people like to conflate that and kind of go off into a tangent about the poor children and whatnot, which, I mean, it is an argument to an extent within itself. However, it does not really count as terrorism just because... It doesn't you, apply to the definition itself. Well, yeah, because everybody does have a political and ideological belief, regardless of whether you like it or not. But it's what that act is that act going to be pushing forth for the benefit of that belief? Or is it going to be pushing forth um, a state and sponsored or the for this uh, state creation kind of understanding, like more in the Machiavellian kind of sense? And that's where you would see the kind of like uh, lines being drawn. Whereas you could see, you could say that a lone wolf attack was done in a Charlottesville, I think it was, right? Yes. Mm. Yeah, Charlottesville. That was a lone wolf terror attack to an extent because you were, it was a, an individual that went against other civilians for the purpose of striking fear into the protesters. However, did it, it was, it's a very loose form of terrorism at that aspect because it doesn't have that political weight to it. And I think that's what's important to consider is the political weight and what the end goal is in just doing it because just pure terror alone doesn't count as a political motive. And it is interesting to see the lines blurred with certain instances uh you know you look at something like dylan roof where the 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 church shooting in uh charleston. In, in charleston, charleston. and you know <clears throat> i think that's certainly fair to say that he was advancing or trying to advance a certain agenda a uh, explicitly agenda. racist agenda which and i think that people will maybe say that racism isn't political but i think that it <laughs> really certainly can be and you know that's that's very clear cut there but what about instances where somebody commits a, a an act of violence on mass and then they you know find out that this person happens to be a white nationalist or they happen to be a i don't know catalonia independence advocate um <laughs> it's it's tough there because how do we know why if they committed that act so, for that purpose. So then let's talk about media coverage in terms of terrorism. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. big a part does the media play in the coverage of terrorism? Because I read somewhere that as soon as we found out that the shooter at YouTube was an Iranian woman, most coverage stopped. Whereas yes. if it was a white man, it would have been all over. They're trying to figure out why why would he do this? What, yeah. His environment. They're trying mm -hmm. to understand the situation, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Um, and so they do. And I, you know, I hear this from a lot of people who I would typically disagree with on many things, but um, I, I do see it when there's a white, uh, and it doesn't have to be a white person necessarily, but a, uh, a non-Muslim, non kind of foreign um, agenda terrorist they they look a lot more into the person they you know you see the media talking a lot more about who they were and uh, it's interesting i'm not i'm not sure if that means anything but it is certainly an interesting phenomenon mm -hmm. yeah um i think the media plays a huge role in exposing terrorism especially foreign terrorism because without the media we wouldn't even know it, uh, about it um what what i i find very interesting in in the coverage of terrorism in the media is that I don't think it's like a lot of people have have said that it's been a, a bias towards the coverage of radical Islamic terrorism. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily agree because 
I, I've been watching the news since I was like 10, like regularly watching the news and trying to understand it since I was like 10. And I remember young being younger and terror attacks in Afghanistan were covered nonstop. Mm-hmm. Non-stop, constant coverage, constant sort of, you know, the CNN panels and understanding of things like that. But now, Afghanistan has sort of been swept under the rug. And now it's mostly about Syria. And stuff it's like mostly, that. one, about Syria. Yeah. Two, um, about uh, radical Islamic terrorism in European countries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I feel like what the media has now focused on is, you know, this sort of what we've been discussing, this sort of collective ideology that uh, Sayed mentioned, um, being... Uh, put to action in foreign countries, particularly um, European countries, you know, mm-hmm. sort of quote unquote white countries. Um, and I think that's where the media comes in and they play up a lot of what happens mm-hmm. um, versus if it's radical Islamic terrorism in Islamic countries, it's sort of swept under the rug. There's mm-hmm. a little sort of blurb uh, in the CP24 sort of yeah. reel. And uh, most, that's. Yeah, most of the time, like any type of situation like that, it just shows like. Oh, ten people died in a bombing. Yeah, in this exactly. One city yeah. in Afghanistan, or something. And then like they that. go yeah. to a story so, of like a puppy that was. Rescued. Yeah, it's like it's, it's just... not that big of a deal, <laughs> even though. Yeah, it no, is. Like, they it, don't it's, think it's, it's a very big, big deal, deal. Yeah. Um, and it's it's sad that I don't think it's a big deal mm-hmm. because I've been so desensitized to it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, I think that uh, foreign terrorism committed by <clears throat> different movements is very covered by the media, and that's a big part of where they play. And. Let's let's now talk about since we're on the topic of foreign foreign versus domestic. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people say that the biggest threat um, is domestic white terrorism, while others say that the biggest threat is foreign Islamic extremism. What is the biggest threat? And let's talk about these two classifications that really the media just puts terrorists in. It's really one or the other, mm-hmm. isn't it? Now, th- this is something I'm really interested in hearing uh, from our guests on, but uh, Elliot yeah, guys, did... feel free to chime in whenever you want. Elliot yeah. did right, task right. me with uh, getting some numbers, and uh, so I did look into this a bit, and uh, from a pure numbers perspective, um, and this is just in the States, just in the U.S., and adjusted for outliers um, being 9-11 and the Oklahoma City bombings, so those were taken out of the equation. Um, and so in... There's been, I think it was 190 terrorist attacks um, in the last uh, two decades in the States. And um, it was 77% were Islamic um, with uh, with white nationalist or right wing, which were put into the same category, coming in second. And um, in third place was uh, left wing or... Um, Eco terrorism, um, and so from a pure numbers perspective, there's certainly an argument that Islamic terror is the biggest threat there. But I don't think that the numbers are the only thing that we need to look at here. Well, I wanted to point out, like you have to understand the kind of structure and the belief system that comes from these terrorist groups, for example, because you have the wide variety from ISIS to Boko Haram to um, uh, the well, technically, they're not listed as a, a terrorist organization, the but the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood yes, who, ha, well, with Sayyid Qutub, he was the one that, in, back in the 1920s, that actually started putting forward this understanding of the House of War, or Dar al-Harb, Dar, Dar al-Harb. and this was the kind of ideology which was kind of being put forth because it was understood well, like, due to numerous hadith and the Quran itself that there was a a recognizance to have a sultan so like a sultan which means like authority and when you have this authority it must be coming from a muslim ruler alone and you cannot you must do everything that you can to get to ensure that you have a muslim ruler and if you do not have this muslim ruler you must go to whatever means necessary however it does not mean necessarily mean violence in every single regard which is why you saw the peaceful takeover by Mohammed Morsi in Egypt back in 2013, I believe. And this is where things get really muddy, I would say, at least. And Saeed, what do you think? Um, in regards to what domestic terrorism and uh, foreign international terrorism, I would definitely say domestic terrorism is kind of trumped up. And 
it, it ties into the idea of because we all know the colloquial use of terrorism. We can spot what is a terrorist act and what is a lone shooter act. But this idea of it can also spawn from an individual, most specifically a white individual, kind of brought this duality to terrorism that a Muslim terrorist is the same as a white nationalist. So that kind of dichotomy seeped into our politics to say that Islamic terrorism is as worse as domestic terrorism, which is blatantly false. Um, dom domestic terrorism is not an issue. I think it is agitation by people that is <laughs> trumped up. Take. Yeah. But foreign international terrorism is an ideology that is completely opposed to Western ideals that is now seeping into judicial systems, legislation systems, people thought we're already seeing these enclaves forming in Europe. Clash of and civilizations. Clash of civilizations, you got it. And that is a way bigger threat than some white nationalists. Yeah, I want to agree with uh, what Steve has to say. And actually, with the, what was it? Clashes of what? Organizations? Clash of civilizations. Civilizations, sorry. Yeah, like we see that, like, um, I don't, obviously, I don't think there would be a correlation, but like, there is a. Like, um, it's by Samuel Huntington. It's an essay written in the mm -hmm. 90s. And, okay. it, and it ended up coming to basically the um, fruition, basically. That's what a lot of people said. Mm -hmm. It's because after the Ottoman Empire fell, you didn't no longer have this duality between the East and the West. Mm -hmm. And it was just completely Western dominance, which explains why there's a lot of hatred towards Western powers. Mm -hmm. So with the collapse of that, now you have a new forming identity that took a while to collapse. And then you have a lot of detractors that will say, no, 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 that never happened. Th this is completely mm -hmm. relatively There is a BS. lot of Clash of Civilization deniers out there, and I, I don't know where I stand on it um, myself. I still have to read into that more. But, but for that, is that a lot of people do deny the existence of it. So that only applies to the end of the Ottoman Empire? And we're still seeing the effects of it, though? Uh, like, like, no, now, it's, a, right? it's an eternal thing. It's always been a Clash of Civilizations from microcosm to macrocosm. Okay, so, yeah. like, so, my idea about this, like what I'm relating it to, is like the mass like um, influx of uh, Muslim immigrants coming into Western civilizations and how that would have its effect. So you understand on, it. Yeah, yeah, you didn't have to. Yeah. Sorry. So it's, it's a very easy thing to understand. <laughs> yeah. No, I was yeah. just commenting on that. It's uh, I don't know. it's very interesting to hear. It's but, the culture. Um, That's how, why. Mm -hmm. How as soon as you hear about it, it's something that you recognize yeah. that you pick up. Uh, you don't. You didn't have to have it explained to you. No, you exactly. got it. And um, because I think Maybe it's something that we all. Maybe a good explanation from our guest was good. I hope that with that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, <laughs> they, I mean, the actual how it manifests itself. You didn't have to have that explained to you because it's something you see. Mm -hmm. And is it something that is necessarily there? Uh, I would probably lean towards yes. Um, the clash of civilizations? Yeah, but I, I again, I'm not particularly well read on that issue. Uh, so I don't want to say definitively yes, but um, I think well, anybody would say yes, it, it appears to be the case. Because well, Marshall, the thing is, is that I think what, again, going back to Syed's complete point is that... Um, it's always about individual versus collective. And that's a very hard thing to actually find the underpinnings of. And the you have to go through this big brush and this big blur. And you have to try and make these clear lines out of things that aren't necessarily that exactly clear. It's because every kind of circumstance does have its influence. But then there is this overall overarching kind of basis to everything that you will do. Like, for example... I like to base my beliefs off of Western civilization and the greater powers that be. I'm not necessarily against um, the idea that the colonial powers were good. I think that they were actually probably fantastic to some degree because of the actual layout and structures that they provided. Like, for example, you didn't. You had the same thing, though, that same dichotomy given by the Ottoman Empire. And once that was removed, mm. it all fell apart. And then they started making nation states. Exactly. That didn't even necessarily exist, and it never had existed before within the Muslim world. And I think that was one of the biggest mistakes possible, because mm -hmm. you should have had these, instead of creating these nation states that would come later to frankly bite you in the ass, mm -hmm. they, this would because they would eventually ally themselves and make it an ethnic aspect later on, when it was never that to begin with, because Islam is quite literally a universalist religion even though it is within specifically the region of the uh, well <laughs> all the way from no from north africa all the way to indonesia the what can i say yeah. 
And I, I just want to uh, have a look at some viewer comments here. So we've got uh, Sherwin, and I, I'm sorry for reading your comments so late, Sherwin, but he said, uh, since the active uh, shooter at YouTube headquarters had a vendetta against the ban on gun imagery, was that terrorism? And now, Sherwin, I got to say, I don't think that was the case, that she it had wasn't. a vendetta against gun imagery. Uh, if it is, that's not confirmed. Um, I mean, in my research of it last night, it appeared that uh, her issue was uh, YouTube's censorship. And not to say that that's why she committed the shooting, but that is something that she was definitely angry about. And um, so even having, you know, not, not liking gun imagery, is that a political ideology or oh, is that a personal yeah, preference? Yeah, I'd say so. I'd because say that then depends. Over these past because months. it depends. Not, you know, not everything is automatically political, political yeah. but everything can be political, I'd mm -hmm. say. I think any idea has the and capacity think, yeah, to become political. Do you that. think now, speaking of politics, and we're going to go back to what one of uh, our guests um, said about uh, Islam in a second, but speaking in terms of politics, do you think, um, do you all think that terrorism and shootings, they're, they're over-politicized nowadays? Um, no. no. Yeah, no. Um, I think that... Um, Hard no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to wow. clarify the meaning of over-politicized in the context that you're asking, because I'm getting all these no's, and I was expecting some yeses, yeah, so maybe I, I I'm thinking I thought thing. I was going to get some yeses, but by over-politicized, what I mean is that people just use the issue to play to their political uh, viewpoint. Mm. So, for everybody? example, well, that's what I'm saying. Has it been too over -polit uh, overly politicized? For example, is it, it's, it feels like it's no longer there's been a shooting, this is a tragedy, that's it. It's now there's been a shooting, while well, the right is to blame, while well, the left is to blame. That's, so here's, that's my here's what I'll say. I don't think that politicizing an issue like that is a problem inherently. Um, you know, if something happens having a response to it, a political response to it, is um, is probably the best thing. Uh, now, it doesn't, there's no one certain response to it, it, certain issues, but having a, a political or legislative or what have you response to a, an issue, a big issue, is, is how things should work. What I will say is that people immediately jump to these crazy conclusions as soon as something happens. So that's what I'm asking. Yeah. And so one thing I saw, and this is totally anecdotal, and it's not really representative of, of anything, but it is it is representative of something, kind of the climate we live in, I suppose, but nothing more serious than that is um, as soon as the YouTube shooting happened, and I was I was looking for the new episode of Philip DeFranco, and I know it because I wanted to watch it with my dinner. <laughs> um, oh, God. And I, I was no, I noticed there was no new episode, so I start looking all over, and I see like one minute ago YouTube shooting, and immediately this this guy, and now I can't remember his name, he was some journalist. Immediately says, "Oh look, the NRA has more blood on their hands," and uh, you oh, know, yeah, um, I saw that. Yeah, spicy. I don't know about that. I I think that's a bit of an over politicization because this happened in California, where the NRA really doesn't have too much power. One of the few states where they their lobby has not dug its roots in. Um, you said it was a German journalist? No, no, no. I said, um, sorry, I might have mumbled there. I just said it was some journalist. Yeah, oh, I heard German. <laughs> oh, I, mean, I would I like to interject, <laughs> and I don't feel like it's an over-politicization. I think it's an issue of scope because um, it is a normal reaction when a tragedy happens that everyone goes, how do I mitigate that? How do I stop something from happening? But the left and the right approach it at different ways. The left is saying... Let's treat the symptoms. The right is saying, let's treat the cause. The cause is, if people don't want to admit it, it is clash of civilizations, which is why when I see countries which do not have um, multicultural nations which are homogenous, even though they have high gun ownership, there are no gun debts. And I see places where there is heavy gun legislation like Chicago or Britain, and I see gun shootings and mass knife stabbings. So are we going to ban knives? Are we going to get? Well, are we going to ban? They've done that knives? now. They've done that now in Britain. <laughs> yeah, you got to get your. Uh... Boy, mate, you have that license for the knife in the butter. <laughs> you got your cutlery. Yep, great right. accent, buddy. Oh, yeah, my bad. <laughs> that was actually really good. Yeah, um, but uh, Humphrey know, Humphrey comes in clutch, That's and Austria, uh, Austria. Humphrey is actually a friend of uh, mine and John's. Um, and uh, he says, perfect example, the YouTube shooter, um, Michael Ian Black, that was the journalist, called the NRA a terrorist organization, even though the shooter wasn't an NRA member. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, yeah, that's, 
Exactly. My yeah. point is, is there anything wrong with politicizing these issues? Not necessarily. And Sam brings up a good point in these comments saying it's only, it's only over politicized because the means to share information has increased. And he's right. Mm. Um, but the huge leaps to these conclusions that people deem absolute gospel truth as soon as something happens, mm -hmm. that is the problem. Yeah. Um, well, there's no objectivity, right? Yeah. Uh, that also ties into one issue. Isn't that an objective statement? <laughs> <laughs> I want to shoot myself. <laughs> um, that also ties into one issue that I've regularly mentioned on this show and I've been very passionate about, and it's this sort of idea of clickbait. Um, mm -hmm. And hear me out for a second. So what I think is that when, when an issue happens, this sort of knee-jerk reaction that everybody's waiting for, they're all waiting to find out why, why did this happen, why did this, mm -hmm. and... Uh, news news broadcasters and journalists and pundits and celebrities and everybody and their dog sort of comes online and they give their their hot take and they they do it for for the story. This journalist got recognized because he made such a big conclusion. This is the NRA has more blood on their hands. Hundred k retweets, four hundred k likes, whatever. Um, as soon as Dylan Roof came out, even before the media had enough time to comment, they're going to be like, oh, this shooter is not going to be considered a terrorist. Yeah. 100K, retweets, yeah, yeah, yeah. 100K retweets, 400K <laughs> likes. Um, I believe that he was a terrorist. And I know that goes uh, yeah, against no, some of the opinions too. here. But again, it's this sort of like, ooh, let's, let, let's you know, rock the boat a little bit. And let's give our opinions. But we sort of water down our opinions with what's going to get the most reaction, what's going to provoke the most people. Mm -hmm. And that goes both for the right and the left. So and does clickbait mm -hmm. play a huge role in the over-politicization? Even I though you guys absolutely. don't think there absolutely. is an over-politicization. I think no. I think yes. I, I was going to say that I, uh, I, I sort of jumped a little bit where I was like, no, 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 no. Because the over-politicization comes from journalists and news broadcasters wanting to get the most views possible. Like I remember, it's all about ratings. yeah, mm -hmm. I remember uh, back in 2014 when Operation Daughter. Protective Edge happened in Gaza. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the same night, uh, the Malaysia airline lost um, the second plane, or it got shot down by the Ukrainian missile. It was the same night, the invasion of Gaza, and that. And I like Wolf Blitzer was sweating on CNN, <laughs> sort of jumping in between. Okay, we're going to talk about the plane. We're going to talk about Gaza. We're going to talk about the plane. We're going to talk about Gaza. And it was sort of this like, ah, look at all this news. Like yes, like feel it in his veins. <laughs> The 140-year-old Wolf Blitzer has now been given the elixir of life for 10 more years. Um, and, and, and that's a big issue for me, this sort of exposure. And it sort of waters down big issues, and it sort of waters down the discussion on what is the problem, what are the roots, mm -hmm. what are the causes, where is the dichotomy, yeah. um, why did this happen, and it sort of become, let's, you know rile up as many people as we can. Yeah, and, I want to bounce back on what Adam has to say about the whole clickbait thing. I would say the very important role about it is like the title and stuff like that. And yeah. we've seen the mm. biggest, um, uh, what's the, not victim, culprit uh, possible is Vox. Like I'm just pulling mm. it up right now. Yeah. Every Vox single time the like they have like a major issue, like a shooting happens, they always come up with some new video, trying to bring them some facts and trying to just... Um, basically show off their political agenda aesthetically of yeah, course yeah, yeah ex exactly mm -hmm. with the graphics and stuff like that it makes you want to view it it's also Al Jazeera's the same way yeah AJ they Plus got, they got AJ Plus yeah. nobody remembers them do they but I, don't even know, <laughs> I didn't even know it was Al Jazeera <laughs> yeah, at the time yeah. did, did it's you know clever that? marketing yeah well the thing is is it's very funny because Qatar itself is actually the headquarters currently of the Muslim Brotherhood yes like, like it that. is the <laughs> nexus of the whole under, like the whole like organization mm -hmm. itself mm -hmm. and when I really no I was just going over this this morning to like refreshing up like my own little debate and my information just making sure I actually have the correct information and I was looking there but even Saudi Arabia and the rest of the UAE uh, Russia and other and well most of the Gulf states themselves all have the Muslim Brotherhood specifically listed as a terrorist organization meanwhile you have Qatar that's like spouting out leftist propaganda and well, blatantly false information 90% of the time that I actually look, or at least it's just information that's put out there and skewed about an event that happens and how they try to turn it towards their own little understandings. Mm -hmm. But then you also have like uh, the Western countries, like the CIA actually is recorded to saying, do not put the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, no matter how much you want to, because it will flare up tensions with mm -hmm. potential allies mm -hmm. and i that made me think this morning and i'm like 
Why? Now, isn't that a problem, though, if you can't label a terrorist group a terrorist group? Yeah, and I mean, that's something that goes on all sorts of shenanigans, especially involving the states with, you can't call this thing this thing and I mean it was like the genocide I'm, thing too that's another example yeah and shut I, up Russian yeah. troll and I'm, I'm certainly uh, one thing that I, comes to mind that really has nothing to do with any of this is uh, just an issue that always makes me really mad is uh, Canada not being able to call that uh, uh, industrial ingredient a carcinogen or else the US government was going to sue them so you know giving us cancer and uh, the Canadian government can't even tell us but I, I wanted to get to some comments here and Humphrey brings up a good point. I didn't realize what he was talking about at first, but he he mentions those South Park and it's Muslims meme. Um, Whenever something happens, you you often see, and uh, I I don't know if you guys have seen it, but uh, memes um, based off something from South Park. I don't watch it, so I'm not sure what the context is. But uh, the caption will be, and it's Muslims, right after uh, a shooting. And I remember right after Parkland, um, Reddit, the (laughs) Donald, full of, uh, this kid was a Muslim, this kid was Antifa, this kid was a communist, and Alex, or not Alex Jones necessarily, but Infowars, saying, he's a a commie. And, um, I mean, we've got a bit of a gun debate brewing in the comments, and I don't want to get into that too much, but uh, Mm. Karina says, I have my uh, position and acquisition license um, and you have to go through the RCMP here in Canada with background and reference checks. And I just want to know what you're referring to there, Karina. I'm not sure what your context is there. We may have kind of brushed by that. But Sam says, uh, if you have to ask permission to own a firearm, then it's not a right. It's an allowance by the state. Meaning that in Canada, we don't we do have not have the right. Amendment. No, we I mean, um, we, we... No, we get licensed just like driving. Yeah, like, yeah. we, we did... Uh, obviously, down. it's more difficult to get but there was a time when we had inherited that right but it was only for protestants to protect themselves from the popists mm-hmm. well so. also <laughs> don't forget that like currently justin trudeau is cracking down with gun legislation as well in canada with absolutely no basis in doing so and it is targeting it's just specific. a response from all these american shooters yeah, yeah. 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 exactly yeah. that's now, my point now is it doesn't make any real any sense because already canadian gun laws are based on fear it has literally nothing to do with the effectiveness of the weapon <laughs> yes, it's always just like yeah the, ooh, scary <laughs> AK with my scary Russian variant. Oh, wow. <laughs> that thing that can be dragged through mud is really fantastic and can really work well. That shouldn't be in the hands of the Canadian citizen. No, no, no. Even if it's semi-automatic and has only five rounds in the magazine. <laughs> and, yeah, a and semi-automatic so- pistol that looks like an AK-47? Yep, it is an AK-47. I mean, an AR-47, and right? And let's, let's talk about that, though, because weapons are, are, are a big factor when we, talk, when we talk about terrorism, because now we've seen so many other forms of terrorism. We've seen, obviously, knives. We've seen trucks. Yeah. We've yeah. seen people use vehicles. Yeah. What, are we going to yeah. ban cars a, and ban but vehicles? But that's a response to all of these gun legislations that are happening in Europe. Like, one, one of those terrorist like, attacks. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't equate it to all of them. The like, gun legislation is not take. new. It's not a new thing in Europe. Right. Um, and so... It's. I can't it's say it's a access. response. I don't really think we can comment too much on that specific. I mean, the trucks thing is actually a declaration by Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, the ISIS leader, mm-hmm. to actually commit atrocities mm-hmm. in Birmingham and UK in large. Yeah. And and now, what, sorry, what was the the idea of that decree specifically? Why, why trucks? It was that um, the jihad is. Um, it was just used to be conventional warfare. But he kind of gerrymandered a hadith where it said a hadith is basically a saying, a verified saying of the prophet. Mm -hmm. And he said that Muslims living in in, a non-Muslim land can inflict terror in the cause of Islam by any means necessary. Dar al-Harb. Yes, exactly. So because gun legislation was so strict, he's saying resort to knives, resort to guns. Mm -hmm. Um, He literally said suicide by cars. That's, that's I see. Yeah. I didn't and, even know that. And now let's. Um, I want to go back to um, talking about how domestic terrorism is, um, as Saeed said, not a threat. Um, it. This is a very hot button issue, and the responses are going to be hot. So, you know, I want to direct this at Saeed firstly. But what are your thoughts on when people? Well, when people compare Islam and and radical Islamic terrorism and like, what is the connection? Is there a connection? Um, And is it, you know, is it just a lone wolf who reads into Islam improperly? Um, Is it part of the teaching? So what are your thoughts on this? Wait, so are you talking domestic terrorism? No, no, no. Because domestic is not an issue. The biggest, you know, foreign terrorism is um, 
Islamic extremism, and I want to ask you about that. Is the um, foundational like basis to it? That's what he means. Uh, the foundational basis yeah. is, um, as I said, just like sleeper agents of ISIS. You have people that are acting in towards the vices. And hot when, hot whenever hot somebody hot. talks about, okay, he joined ISIS, you know, he's not Muslim. That's not factually true because they actually do get some parts of the theology right. So we, what we're supposed to ask instead of devouring, uh, disavowing ISIS as un-Islamic, we should be saying, okay, these guys have something that is attracting Muslims and even converts to their cause. Mm -hmm. What is that? And it is and what do it you is think exactly is? a call to arms. It's adrenaline. It's anti-vest sentiments that is most popularly trumped by Marxism in uh, in the Western world, and just anti-West sen uh, sentiment that have been brewing in Iraq and Iran because of the invasions. These are the catalysts. Um, if I would like to go on a tangent, I actually had a friend who was um, studying in Australia, Gold Coast, and he had a friend from Saudi Arabia, and he had some family ties to Syria, and he was seeing all these atrocities committed in uh, Syria. And on his fourth year, he was actually getting a doctorate. Um, he said that he's actually leaving everything behind. He had a good life. He had good grades. And he went to Syria to fight with ISIS. And two months later, he actually saw his name come up in the news in a drone strike. Wow. wow. Yeah. And, yeah, and I mean, it is definitely a conversation worth having how people are able to be attracted to... Yep. To these things, and one one thing I, I often hear. Uh, sorry, Elliot, I, you can go. Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, is it important to say that there is a problem with radical Islam? There is a problem with radical Islam. Yeah. It's there is definitely one. It's important to say it a lot of the time because people take that being said as offensive yeah. to all Muslims when it really shouldn't be. Even though it is, it is. And it's been sort of, there hasn't been a lot of clarification with it. It's been conflated. Yeah. Um, and because in a sense, it does make people think that and all it, Muslims yeah, are terrorists, it does. which and isn't and fair. It does, and a lot of people, and a lot of ignorant people do think that. Like, the, the issue is there. But the more we talk about it and isolate it as radicalism, the more and more we can sort of not conflate the two. And I think mm -hmm. that it's important to... to I do have a question for Hamza here. Yeah. Um, does ISIS or any of these radical groups like Al Qaeda actually practice technically ijtihad in terms of jurisprudence within? Um, to a certain and degree. And for our viewers, sorry, uh, for our viewers, what was the term you yeah. just used? Uh, ijtihad. It's um, it's an Arabic for jurisprudence. So oh, uh, sorry, you did law okay. basically. So what he's technically saying is like, do they follow Sharia strictly? Uh, if I may clarify, right? Yeah, that's basically what I meant. Um, they do to a certain extent, yes. There are, but here's here's the kicker. Because um, because they're so violent, a lot of liberal-leaning Muslims would disavow them, which is hypocritical of them because in the Quran you have all these commandments which, you know, there is no interpretation needed. There was There was killing... And it is in Islam. Islam is a warring religion as much as it, as it is a peaceful one. Mm -hmm. The kicker is that they gerrymandered it to apply it to every Muslim, even living in non-Muslim nations. And one of the examples I saw was that you cannot have a peace treaty with non-Muslim countries. You have to be always in this state of jihad where you always have to keep fighting them, which is not true. And sorry, not to cut you off. Yeah. Uh, we're just running short on time, but I just want to finish with a quick last <laughs> question. But even though the, the what you're saying is extremely important, and you know we might even do like a part two on this because it's no so worries. important. But last question, really quickly, is you know what what do we do? What do we do to stop or suppress terrorism? Because that's uh, what we all want to know. Yeah, Target the funding. That. I can't mm. answer that. Target Ooh. the funding. Target the funding. Um, the geopolitical issues that are happening are more to do with ISIS getting a foothold because when the U.S. troops left that field, you had a lot of power vacuum. A lot of ISIS troops were literally armed with U.S. Humvees and um, arsenal. 
and also independent sheikhs from independent Saudi Arabia sheikhs, and exactly. the Gulf Emirates and also Iran, which yeah. is not a conflation in, what, in kind of any regard whatsoever. It's just private donations and money exactly. that's being, being sent out, and then those nations also do get blamed. Yeah, I think the U.S. has a big job to do in terms of stopping the intervention and, you know, Trump pulling out of Syria. Good move. That's one of the main reasons Great I liked him. Great move. And that's what needs to keep happening. They need to pull out of, uh, you know, they need to stop drone striking uh, Yemen. And and that's, I think, going to be a big step if that happens. It, it's, it needs to happen. Yeah, um, for me, very, very big uh, with Marshall is to stop the intervention, stop, you know, you know, sort of mind your own business, uh, America, and but do it in a way not in this, not in the way that you sort of, you know, quit Syria or quit uh, Iraq and you just sort of get up and leave. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to leave a transitional government in place. You want to leave. Um, you want a state build. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You want a state build and you want to aid in state building. You don't want to prop up a puppet government that ends up being corrupt. And well, just, you want to going to collapse in a few quick yeah, years. Exactly. Right? Well, look at Japan at the end of World War Two. That's a very in, like a solid comparison that I would say is like the ultimate example of taking over a nation and installing a properly set up government through authoritarian measures that actually safeguards all the citizens despite the cultural ten tensions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you fail to get their respect at the same time and show weakness, that will be exploited. And I think I'm yeah. just going to cut no, it off. Yeah. That. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just stopping intervention, putting up uh, proper governments, uh, aiding the transition, and again, tracking the funding and stopping the funding. Mm -hmm. I would say from and a social issue, like potentially, like I've discussed this with Marshall before, like sometimes, like if we've had a conversation about uh, Islam and stuff, like, um, like we've seen that like Catholicism and like uh, Judaism have had like a reformation in the past and stuff like that. I feel like that will be necessary in the future, mm -hmm. and that will really just help. Um, <laughs> like it, it, it needs yeah. to be like if to, to, for us to cooperate and to like to prevent. I'll just be honest; it stuff. won't happen. I know like, it will never happen. That's just me being an optimist, yeah. but <laughs> like, reformation is what isn't but, even needed yeah. for Catholicism or Judaism. I'll be I'll that. be honest. We'll, we'll need two more episodes for that. Yes. <laughs> we'll need two more episodes. Well, we could honestly, you know, it could happen, uh, but. I have to cut it off there, unfortunately. Uh, that was our show for this week and for this season. Uh, thank you to everyone that tuned in and that messaged us live over the course of our fourth season. We will hopefully be back in September with our fifth season, but stay tuned for some more potential content over the summer. Uh, make sure you've commented a hot take as well from the show to be entered into our contest. Uh, thank you to our special guests for coming on. We really appreciate it. We had a great discussion. Thank you. Um, it was a good time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we really enjoyed the you know information that you brought to the show and the perspectives that you had. Uh, so that's all for now. Uh, thank you to again to our special guests. Thank you to the OGs, Marshall, Adam, and Daniel. Uh, on behalf of all of us, have a great day, everyone.